back in the book of Psalms once again. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119. We're going to be looking at verses 33 to 40. And tonight's message is entitled, Finishing Strong. Uh, if you're familiar with your Bible, it has a whole lot to say about uh, those who were truly saved, or those who were born again, uh, enduring or persevering to the end, right? That's a, a definite proof that somebody is truly saved. But the fact of the matter uh, is that uh, when you've been saved, that we've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We just talked about that in our discipleship time this evening. And it is this relationship and this filling with the Holy Spirit uh, that helps us to know that we can be uh, certain of our relationship with God. And, and with that gives us certainty of uh, where we'll spend our eternity and all these things that comes with being a believer. We, we get that. But what do we do now, right? You know, we, sometimes we look about, you know, I, I know I'm saved, I, and I know that I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus, but what about now, right? What, what about how am I supposed to, to live now? How is this supposed to in, impact me now? Or, or how can I be sure that I'm not going to live my life in a way where I just basically just get by, just stroll through day by day, and, and, and that's pretty much it. How can we thrive spiritually, right, for lack of a better word? How can we really, uh, you know, move forward in our walk with Christ, or better yet, how can we make sure that we will finish strong, right? Have you given much thought to that? Right? You, have, you, have you really pondered that question? How can we make sure that we do these things? Because uh, I think that I know... Uh, you know, too many Christians that really, uh, if they were willing to be honest, they're just fine with getting by, right? Just getting by spiritually. They're okay with that. They've grown uh, comfortable in their uh, spiritual mediocrity. They, they've grown, as the Bible says, lukewarm, right? And they're okay with that. They're, they're perfectly fine with that. Instead of striving to, to give God their very best, what they do is they'll give God the leftovers of their lives, right? And the Bible also speaks quite a bit to that. But here's the the, the real enigma, I guess you will, or the real, you know, the crazy part about this is, is that those individuals who are okay with living in me- mediocrity spiritually, uh, uh, they will strive for excellency uh, in other areas of their lives. That's what's really the crazy thing. You think about uh, one example is that in their careers, you know, they'll strive for excellence there. They'll uh, put in all the extra time to learn all they can to move up in the company. They'll attend all the training sessions and seminars to learn new skills to make themselves more valuable to the company. Uh, They'll even show up to work when they're sick to show how dedicated they are. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes people in church, will they'll sneeze before they leave the house and they stay home because all of a sudden they're sick because they sneezed. But yet you'll go to work with a fever, right? Though you shouldn't, but that's what I'm saying is that you'll do these things uh, to, to, to make the people in your workplace think that you're a valuable employee. And then if they have children, what they'll do is they'll expect that same type of excellence out of them too in other areas, except for in their spiritual walk. They'll strive for, uh, in their children's academics, right? They'll, they'll expect them to do the very best they can there, that the parents will make sure they'll uh, do the best they can in school, that they'll make sure they do their homework, they'll make sure they study for all their tests, they'll make sure all their assignments are turned in uh, when they're supposed to be. And heaven forbid they begin to struggle in an area and they drop below a certain you know, a loud grade point average in the home, guess what mom and dad is going to do? We're going to get them a tutor. We're going to make sure they get all the help they need so we can keep that GPA up there where we want it to be. And in others, they'll do with the same thing with their children and their athletics, right? Athletic abilities. We want them to be the very best, to be the, the, the excellent athlete that they should be. And they'll spend anywhere from uh, three to five days a week out on the practice field, about two hours a pop, something along those lines. And then whenever... You don't have practice. You know what you do? You practice at home. Then that, that day you have off from practice, then you get out of the yard and practice for two more hours then also. And, and so you don't want to fall behind. And you make sure they have the, the, the equipment they need, the very best. Uh, they'll have these training camps and clinics and all these things to help them to be the best athlete, whether it's a ball player or a cheerleader or whatever the case is. We'll have all these things so they can be the very best uh, uh, that they can be in those situations. And listen to me, nothing wrong with, with your, you being excellent in what you do. That's great. Nothing wrong with you pushing your child to be excellent in their academics or, 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 or uh, uh, whatever it is you have them involved in. The problem is that we should have that same, if not more, uh, drive in us to be excellent as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. That's the difference. Why do we seek to be so great 
in every other area of our life, but we're okay with being mediocre as a follower of Jesus. Right? That's what we're talking about. Something is twisted around there. You see, when we strive to, to be the best at everything else in our lives and not as disciples of Jesus, that we're saying with our lives, the thing we're saying is that, that those other things matter more to us than Jesus does. That's really what it comes down to, and, and that is totally unacceptable, or at least it should be, for a follower of Jesus. You see, as Christians, we're, if we're not striving for excellence in any other area of our lives, let us please, please, please be striving for excellence as disciples of Jesus Christ. That's how we will finish strong. You see, many people start well in the faith, right? We just talked about that with the parable of the sowers, that people will start well in their faith, but very few finish well. And even less can say they honestly finish strong. That the Bible gives us example after example after example of men who began well but faded over time. We think about Lot. We think about Samson. We think about King Saul, just to name a few from the Old Testament. And then in the New, the New Testament, we have the Apostle Paul writing of a man named Demas that was a faithful servant, worked alongside him, winning souls and sharing the gospel from you know, uh, city to city as they moved along. But as we see in Paul's last letter that he wrote, it, it says that, that Demas had forsaken Paul because the pursuit of worldly things had drawn him away. And so the, 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 the writer of this psalm, what he is doing, he's warning to, or, or voicing with uh, his, his words, he's writing this down, that he wants to finish strong, is what he's saying. He wants to finish strong. He doesn't want to just get by, and he doesn't want to fade towards the end, and neither should we. Right? That should be a, a, a prayer of ours, that we should join in him in the same way. That, that finishing strong doesn't happen by accident. Finishing strong only happens if you plan for it to happen. Right? What are the steps that we can take? How can we make sure that we finish strong? And that's what we'll see here in these, these eight verses from Psalm 119. They're going to give us four essentials for living a consistent Christian life that is certain to finish well when our time comes, that we'll be able to finish strong. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Then incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant, who is devoted to to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Father, we give you thanks for your word. Lord, we ask that it would wash over us tonight and and would reveal uh, where we are, exactly where we are as far as our, our commitment to you. Father, are we... Uh, have we grown cold towards you? Or have we grown lukewarm towards you? Are we, are we uh, settling for mediocrity as far as uh, our spiritual walk? Or are we striving for excellence? Are we committing ourselves to you as we should? Father, help us to be the type of church that's pleasing to you. Help us to be the individual followers of Jesus that are pleasing to you. Help us to finish strong. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, you know, I went to, I went to seminary. Y'all know that. Uh, I took five years to get my four-year degree. I, no need for applause. I know that's quite an accomplishment. But you don't have to go to seminary uh, to read this passage, these verses that we have here in front of us, and see that the Word of God is the emphasis of all eight of these verses, right? You can see it. Every, every single one of them has some type of a, an allusion uh, to the Word of God. In fact, uh, every verse in Psalm 119 uh, uh, mentions God's word in, in some form or fashion, right? That is, it's over and over again. You see this. That's the that's the theme of this psalm, and and of course, it's for those of you who know about your Bible, whenever you think about Psalm one nineteen, what is it that stands out? What what is it? What's special about Psalm one nineteen? It's the longest. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, and so that's something else that you can you can store away. It's the longest chapter. Uh, in the in the Bible, and it's and it's really uh, it's longer than some books in the Bible when you think about it like that. So it's this incredibly long 
a continual uh, 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 song of praise, basically. Uh, the author is unknown. We don't know who wrote it. Uh, and as also, we don't know the time of the writing either, though some have speculated uh, that it may have been written after the Babylonian exile, and I'm not even sure why they would presuppose that, but we don't know, and it really isn't important. Uh, if it was, then we would know. The Word of God would have uh, told us that. Uh, so basically, Psalm 119 is this 176-verse uh, song that ex expresses a, a love of and a need for God and His Word by His people. That's basically what this is, that you be, be singing this psalm of praise. And so if we're to finish strong, it will be because of the centrality of the Word of God in our lives, right? That's what this psalm is all about, is it's the centrality of the Word of God in a believer's life that we'd be able to, to live this way now and to assure that we finish strong at the end of our days. And so I would just invite you to, to please don't miss also seeing our dependence on God as we strive for excellence and maturity in His Word. Right, because sometimes if you just hear me saying, well, Brother Mike, you're pushing us and you're saying do all these things and you, and you may be thinking that it's just your willpower, right? Just that muster up and, and get it done. That's not what I'm saying at all, that, that God wants this for us, that He desires for us to do this and His Holy Spirit will enable us and empower us to do these things as we continue to grow uh, and, and seek Him. See, this isn't about our willpower at all. It's actually all about God working out His will for our lives through the revelation of His Word to us, right? And so that's what we're going to see over and over again as we work our way through uh, these verses. So the first essential for finishing strong is to learn the Word of God, right? That kind of seems basic, but that's where you've got to start. You've got to learn the Word of God first. Uh, verses 33 and 34 says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. And so, uh, verse 33 is, is where I got the idea for the, the, the title for this sermon, where it says to, to keep it to the end, right? To, to finish strong. That's the, where, I, where I got the inspiration for uh, the title. And in, in these verses here, the, the psalmist used the terms uh, uh, your statutes and your law to refer uh, to God's word in, in these couple of verses here. Uh, and the psalmist, he had uh, no illusions, right? He had no uh, thoughts or of his own ability to be able to fully know the meanings of the scriptures on his own. And neither should we, right? That's what he's saying here. That I'm, I'm not capable of doing this. I'm not capable of knowing these things. That God must teach us his word, right? He's the one who must do this. Why, whenever I get done praying after I read the scriptures and I say that, that let us sit under God's word tonight, teach us your word. And if you're expecting me, your pastor to, to, to be able to teach you uh, fully the Word of God, you're, you're going to be let down. If you're expecting your Sunday school teacher to be able to teach you fully the Word of God or your discipleship teacher to be able to teach you fully the Word of God, then you're always going to be left wanting more. God is our teacher. He is our ultimate teacher. God is the one who will teach us His Word. God must give us the understanding of His Word. Now, you know, anyone can read the Bible, right? We, you, you know that? It's not like it's coded or or you have to have certain glasses to be able to read the Bible. Anyone can read the Bible. It's, it's a book. In that sense, it's just letters on paper, it's ink, it's nothing special or magical. Anyone can read the Bible. But listen, only Spirit-filled believers can understand it. I mean, really understand it. I mean, you can understand the grammar and stuff like that, but to, I mean, really get the meaning of what the Word of God is saying. That the Apostle Paul made this clear in 1 Corinthians 2.14. He says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That the, the, the Word of God is a spiritual book and it is spiritually discerned. And so just as salvation is a work of God's Spirit drawing us to himself, it is also God's Spirit that teaches us and gives us the ability to understand the Scriptures. That's how it works. Right? And so you say, well, well Brother Mike, I, that makes sense, but how exactly does that work? Explain it to me how this, this process works. And I'll, I would say it begins with a whole lot of prayer. Right? <laughs> a whole lot of prayer. That's where it begins. We, we pray before we read the Bible. We pray while we read the Bible. We pray after we read the Bible. Right? That's how this happens. That Warren Wiersbe put it like this. He's another great uh, Bible commentator that I use uh, pretty regularly. He says this. He says, we must pray for spiritual enlightenment so we may learn God's Word and the way of His Word. It is not enough to read the Bible, outline the books, get answers to questions, and be able to discuss theology. We must come to understand the character of God 
and the working of his providence. Prayer. That's how this happens. That's the main component is prayer. And in case you haven't noticed, we pray a lot here every time we get together. Have y'all noticed that? You, you just kind of just think about maybe next week and sit, get you a, a piece of paper and your pencil and, and, and put a mark on it every time we pray, every time we gather, every week here. We, we bathe everything we do here in prayer. That's the reason for that. The reason behind it is depend upon God. We have a group of men that meet here uh, every Sunday morning at 930 you know one of the main things that we pray for every week? We, we pray for surgeries and concerns, but you know the, one of the main things we pray for is, is for our understanding, for, for teachers and, and, and for myself to be able to, uh, to, to preach and to speak and for people to be able to learn the Word of God. That's one of the main things that we, that we speak of or ask God to do every week. We pray again uh, to dismiss uh, to, uh, to Sunday school. We pray again whenever the, the Sunday school hour, uh, the, the lesson begins. And I'm sure the men's class does and the, and the ladies' class do also, we pray to dismiss after Sunday school. And then, we, then we open in prayer before the worship service. And then we pray for the offering. And most of the time, the people that pray for the offering, you know what they ask also? That we'd understand. Pray, pray for, for the pastor to be able to speak the words of life. For the, to, that we'd have the understanding that God would speak to us over and over and over again. And I pray after we read, I read the passage that we would understand that the Spirit of God would teach us. And I also pray at the end of the message. Right? And then someone else will close us in prayer before we dismiss and go our separate ways. In case you weren't able to keep track, that's nine different prayers that we have here on a Sunday morning. And I would also hope that you pray before you ever leave your house. I hope that you've been praying during the week that for, for, for your own heart, that you would receive your, your, uh, the wisdom of God as you study your Sunday school lesson, that you're praying for your, your teacher, that they'd be able to teach well that week, that you would pray for me, that I'd be able to preach well and faithfully week after week. And so the, one of the, the key components that we see uh, here that's necessary for us is prayer. You see, we read, we study, we listen to the instruction of God's Word. Right? We have those things too. We, we attend, we get involved. We, all these opportunities that we have here, Sunday school, discipleship training, uh, both morning and evening services, uh, the, the midweek devotional and prayer time, and that's just what's available to you here, not to mention what you do on your own. Hopefully you're doing things on your own, uh, own uh, in your homes away from here. And I would say, yes, that, that God has gifted uh, men and women and given them to the church to be able to teach His Word. That is absolutely true, and I'm so thankful for that. But we're also to develop our own uh, discipline to, to learn, uh, to study and read God's Word on our own. Begin to... Feed ourselves, if you will, right? That I instruct you and equip you to be able to, to read the Word of God for yourself, to, to pray on your own, to, to get your own resources and things, to be able to understand and study the, the, the Word of God for yourself and ask God to teach you. You see, that's why I've encouraged uh, all of you to find some type of a Bible reading plan, right? That, that I, I found one last year and I got one for us this year. And if, and if you don't like those, there's plenty more online. And as a matter of fact, your Sunday school books also have reading plans. There's no shortage of information uh, uh, to help us to be able to connect with the Word of God, to be able to, to find a way to, to grow uh, some consistency in our time with the Word. And so we must never cease to be learners, right? Never. We don't cease to, we can't stop being learners, but for, for learning is what it means to be a disciple. That's what a disciple literally means. It means learner. That Jesus made that clear when he gave the Great Commission of Matthew 28. 20, uh, Matthew 28, 19 to 20 says, Go therefore and do what? Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And look at verse 20. Teaching them. Y'all see that? Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You see, either we learn the ways of God from His Word and let Him lead us and shape us into who He wants us to be, or we learn from the world and it will shape us and inform us instead. Right? That's the way it goes. Either, either the Word of God shapes us and informs us, or the world does. And you don't have to look too hard around us and, and look sometimes our own homes and see which one is doing the shaping. Right? It's not the Word of God. The world is shaping our homes and the way we do things, the way we live our lives and set our priorities. Right? And so... Uh, we're to continue in this, that, that, that we never stop learning. We will never understand everything about God and His Word in this lifetime. But listen, we should never stop trying to learn as much as we can. Right, Mr. Lee? Yeah? 
Amen. 87 years old and he's still learning. He's still learning, still, still after, still trying to understand as much of the Word of God as he possibly can. You see, when you think about Jesus and his, and his, his ministry, his public ministry, you know probably 95% of his time uh, he spent was either praying and teaching. That was it. Praying and teaching was mostly what he was doing uh, as he went about. And he is still the one interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, and he is still teaching us his Word through the Holy Spirit. And so this process continues. It's still going on. That the first essential for finishing strong is to learn the Word of God. And the second essential of finishing strong is to obey the Word of God. Right? Now, verse 35 says, Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Right? And that's a peculiar verse, isn't it? Just the way, it's, the way our minds work when you think about make me walk in your paths of commandments, for I delight in it. How many of you can honestly say, you delight in the Word of God, that you delight in its commandments. You delight in all that, that, that the, the Word of God tells us to do, that you actually have a delight in what God uh, has given us through His Word. Right? Most of us, we're honest with you, I, 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 can't, I can't honestly say I delight in all of it because some of it's difficult and it, it really challenges me and it's really pushing me uh, to live in a, in a way that, that I'm not comfortable with. and It's, it's asking me to do things I'm not comfortable in doing. Right, but see, that's the very thing that the psalmist is asking for here. You see, we don't have the ability to be obedient like we should, right? On our own, we can't, apart from the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, we can't be obedient like we should be. And that's what he's talking about here. You know, before we got saved and, and we were lost and condemned in our sins, right? We see that from the Scriptures, that our lives were defined by a continual rebellion against God and His commandments. But the Bible called us sons and daughters of disobedience and children of wrath. That's who we were before we got saved. But you see, one of the strongest pieces of evidence that someone has truly been saved is that they have a, a, an obedience to God's Word now. That that's the big change. That they, they once were living in disobedience and now they're seeking to live in obedience. And so, you know, when you think about after you got saved and you look back over the rest of your life or leading up to the point where you got saved and you think about uh, and how you lived your, your life, you know, it, 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 it shapes who you are. Right? And, and now you understand that the, the price that Jesus paid for you to be forgiven of your sins and, and all that entails, you, you begin to hate it whenever you stumble and when you re sin. Right? Whenever you respond to God in disobedience, it, it breaks your heart. Right? You're not okay with that. You, you're grieved as you're disobedient to God. And so the psalmist is asking God to make him obedient to his commandments because he knows he can't do it on his own. And we should do the same thing. Ask God to, to make me Make me uh, obedient. Help me to, to be exactly who you want me to be. You see, the, the key to this type of obedience, though, is that we, must, uh, you know, that, that we must have a delight for God and a delight for His Word. And that's one thing that we must ask God to grow in us. You see, it's a, it's a joy to be obedient to God and His Word, not a burden. We touched on this tonight. It's the same type of thing. It's, that it's, it's a joy and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a pleasure. It's a privilege that we even have God's Word. It's not a burden. It's, a, it's not like a, a slave obeying his master to avoid being punished, right? If that's why you're, you're, you're reading the Word of God or, or why you're coming to church or whatever it is, if you're doing it so, so God's not mad at you, you're doing it for the wrong thing. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. It's more like a, a grateful child that, that wants to be obedient to please his or her parents. That's a better way of looking at it whenever we seek to be obedient to God and His words. You see that we all know what our lives look like when we try doing things our own, our own way, don't we? We know we can look back to our lives. If you're a believer, you can look back to your life before you got saved and, and what a mess you made. And even now as a believer, when we find ourselves kind of drifting spiritually and beginning to do things on our own and go in our own direction, we make those same mistakes over and over again. We know that. We know from examples that we see that, uh, that we destroy ourselves. And in Proverbs 14, 12 even says, it, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Right? There's a way that seems right. That you know, this, this is the way it should be done, but it's wrong. If it's not God's way, it's not the right way. And so there's an unmistakable uh, uh, connection that we see here between these first two essentials of finishing strong. You see, it's not enough for us to simply learn the Word of God. We must commit ourselves to doing all that it says. That's what James made uh, 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 the statement uh, made it clear in his epistle in James 1 22 he says but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves you see it's, it's good to have a quiet time we should do that but don't just have a, 
a quiet time in the morning with the Word of God, do what the Word of God says. Right? Don't just read it and, and, and check. And, and like me, i got a highlighter. I'll take uh, my highlighter and mark off. After I get done reading the Scripture for the day, I'll, I'll mark it off. Don't just mark it off. Do what it says. If there's things in there to apply and, and action steps or things you can do that day, guess what He expects for us to do? Be obedient. Do what it says. Don't just study your Sunday school lesson or your discipleship lessons. Do what the, the, the studied Word of God says. Don't just listen intently and take great sermon notes. Do what the preached Word of God says. Obedience. Right? Obey the Word of God. Do what the Word of God says. Doing what the Word of God tells us to do is greatly pleasing to God. It brings honor and glory to His name. But you see, it also benefits us greatly, both now and forevermore, is what the psalmist alludes to. There's only one right way to live our lives as the people of God, and that's God's way. That's God's way. By living obedient to the Word of God. The second essential for finishing strong is to obey the Word of God. The third essential for finishing strong is to cling to the Word of God. Cling to the Word of God. Verses 36 and 37. It says, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. You see, it's, it's apparent that you know, even though we're separated from the, the writer of this psalm by thousands of years, uh, that, that he too struggled just like we do. Some things are common with all people, that they're still, we all have this, 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 this problem with coveting worthless things. That the things of this world are, are very appealing to our flesh, right? As we look around, we're bombarded by these things constantly, which serves as a, a reminder that even as Christians, even as being the born again, a child, a children of God that we are, we're not yet perfect, right? We're, we are still drawn away. We are, we are still being pulled back towards those things that are displeasing to God. That we're, we're given an example of this uh, in the book of Genesis. If, you, if you're familiar with the story of, of Abraham and, and his nephew Lot, is when they were traveling and they, their, their, their groups grew so large and they had so many animals and the, the land couldn't sustain both of them. And so Abraham being the the, the, the man that he was and the leader, he, he decided that he had let Lot decide. He said, wherever you decide to go, you go this way. I'll go the opposite, and we're going to split up. And so Lot looked towards uh, uh, Sodom, and he says he saw how green it was, and, and, and everything was there, right? And he says, well, I'm going there. Look at all the stuff they have to offer. In the opposite direction, Abram looks, and all he sees is desert. <laughs> you know, there's nothing there, but he's, but he's going to follow God. He's going to be obedient because God has promised him, made him a great promise. And so Abraham went that way and, and Lot went the other. And we all know how the story goes after that. Uh, after that. that, that Abraham, uh, you know, he, he, his life prospered. He went towards the, the land of promise and, 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 and God was honored uh, with him as a decision. And, and, and his nephew, things went poorly for him. It, went, it, it ended uh, very poorly for him indeed as we know what happened to the city uh, of, of Sodom uh, because of sin. You see, Abraham's story ended well. Lot's did not end well at all. And you would say, well, what are we getting at here? Why, why is this so important, you see? Or how did this happen? Abraham clung to the promises of God and Lot didn't. Right? That's what happened here. That Abraham clung to the promises of God even when he could not see any hint of what God had promised, that he remained faithful, not perfectly by any means. Because if you also know the rest of the story, uh, Abraham had some pretty big slip-ups also along the way. But he still pursued what God wanted him to do. And so for us, we are bombarded with the temptations of the things of this world every waking minute of the day, right? Are we not? That it's always before us. Everywhere we look, there's advertisements. And on TV, and uh, it even comes across your phone or whatever, there's always these things tugging at us. And, and, and many of us are, are tempted, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to go to these things. That many of us are tempted to try to love God and love the things of this world at the same time, right? We, we try to do both. Honestly, we're, we're trying, to, we're trying to, to, to do like everybody else is doing over here, but then we, as, as I think Bill said today, we compartmentalize. We're trying to do both. We're trying to, uh, this is the public me over here. This is the work me. This is me as a student. This is me uh, uh, with my family. And this over here, this is the Christian me. This is the me where I read my Bible. This is me where I pray. This is where I'm committed. This is where I do all these things. And we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't live double lives that way. It doesn't work that way. 
that, that, uh, that we, that's what the Bible calls that as being double-minded, and God does not bless double-minded people. That the Apostle John uh, gave this stern warning to the believers in Ephesus in his first epistle. In uh, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so like this psalmist, uh, we too must ask God to incline our hearts towards the promises found in His Word. Right? To incline our hearts, to, to, to shape and to bend and, and, and help us to lean towards uh, His Word and the promises that He has for us in His Word. That, that we will begin to find our satisfaction in Him and Him alone, not in the the vain and temporary things of this world, that we must continually ask Him to turn our eyes away from worthless things. Do you have any worthless things in your life right now? Right? You say, well, I don't know, Brother Mike, what do you mean by worthless things? If i got to explain it to you, right? You know what they are. You know what those worthless things are. You know what you need to put aside that that's hindering you from being obedient to God. We need to separate ourselves from the things that distract us from following God and His will for our lives. You see, in the good times and the bad times, we must cling to the Word of God, especially His promises regarding His good plan for our lives. We love this verse in Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Right? We love that verse. We cling to that promise. You see, no matter what may come our way, Never give up on the promises of God. Amen? Never, never give up. The third essential for finishing strong is to cling to the Word of God. And the last one, the fourth essential for finishing strong is to respect the Word of God. Right? Respect the Word of God. Verses 38 to 40. It says, Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. You see, we live in a, in a time where nobody seems to respect anyone or anything anymore, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I, I know, especially some of our older folks know exactly what I'm talking about. I think uh, us, us, us middle-aged or younger people are kind of, we're desensitized already. We're used to uh, having kids just saying yeah and no and huh. Right? We're used to it. Right? It still bothers me, but some of, some of our younger parents, don't, it don't even bother them anymore. But uh, our older folks, whenever, whenever kids uh, speak to you, what do you expect them to say? Yes, sir. No, ma'am. There ain't no huh. There ain't no what. Right? Respect. And so we live in a day and an age where those things have just kind of uh, gone to the wayside. And, you know, th- there was a time here, believe it or not, not too long ago, uh, where actually being a Christian, it, it actually meant something good. Right? It was a, it was a good thing to be known as a Christian. That, that even Christians used to be known for their fear and reverence for God. Yeah, can y'all believe that? We used to be known for that, for actually fearing and having reverence for God. And, and Christians actually used to be known for respecting the Word of God, right? And all those things, though, unfortunately, those, are, those days have long since passed. That we can have a revival meeting uh, every other week, and I think some churches do around here. It seems like that they have a, a flyer on our door for somebody having a, a revival meeting. But you see, until Christians once again truly have a fear and reverence for God and a respect for the Word of God, nothing will change. Right? That's the truth. No, nothing will change until we recapture that and we have that, 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 that fear and reverence for God and that respect for His Word. That people say that our nation is in trouble and that everybody is blaming everybody. It's the Democrats, it's the Republicans, it's whatever, whoever you want to blame. But the real blame for the shape of our nation falls on the church it falls on the church it's our fault that the nation is the way it is it's it's our fault that we have set idly by and let things get this way we're the ones that are supposed to know what the word of god says and to make sure that we adhere to it right that it's our fault that we fall asleep on watch that we're supposed to be the ones that set the standard for everyone else to follow and you see if we're not doing that what use are we to our communities or to our nation Right? What, what purpose do we serve? Right? That Jesus made this clear in Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 13 and 16, He says this. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. 
I don't want to be a good-for-nothing Christian, a good-for-nothing follower of Jesus. You see, verse 14 goes on and says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, the, 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 the psalmist here, what he's saying uh, in these verses, that he wasn't afraid of his enemies. That's not what he was afraid of here. He wasn't concerned with what the people thought about him. You know what bothered him? You know what kept him asleep at night? You know what broke his heart? He was afraid of disgracing the Lord and bringing dishonor to his name. That's what bothered him. That's what he was afraid of. You see, in our attempts, I think, to, to, to see more people come to faith in Jesus, that we have made Jesus too much like us. Right? We have made Him too much like us, that there is no fear and trembling anymore before our God, that we simply do not respect God or His Word as we should, that we need to see God as Isaiah did in Isaiah 6. Right? Isaiah 6. Isaiah, we have this recorded for us in the Word of God in, in verse 1 through 5 here of Isaiah Chapter 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each, had, uh, each one had six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right? Do we have that type of awe? Do we see, our, do we see God that way? Do, I, think, I think really... If we're honest, our view of God is far too small. We, we have really made God small in our lives. We'll say big things and we'll make all these big statements, but we live as though uh, our God is very small. That we have grown far too comfortable with God and His Word. That neither one barely have any authority in our lives anymore. And so I would just encourage us tonight to plead with God to send a true and lasting revival into our lives. A true and lasting revival, not one we got to keep having it month after month, or one in the fall, and one in the spring, and one in the summer, and one in the winter, and one for homecoming, and on and on again, just making these just routines. That we'd have true and lasting revival. That our churches would be filled with fear and trembling once again. That every believer would truly respect God and His Word once again. That should be our desire. That's what we should want, to have this type of respect once again for God and His Word. You see, the fourth essential for finishing strong is to respect the Word of God. Right? Respect the Word of God. And so as we close tonight, I don't have a, a long, drawn-out, complicated you know, invitation time. My question is, is just how is your walk with the Lord right now? Right? And I'm, I'm not asking you for, for like my information purposes. I want you to be honest with yourself right, before God and tell Him exactly where you're at. Is, is your walk, is it great? I mean, because I mean, everybody's different. Maybe it's great right now. Maybe it's at an all-time high. You have never walked closer with Jesus than you are right now. Or, 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 you know, or maybe you're, you're one I've talked about already. You're just kind of stuck in mediocrity, right? Are you okay with that? Are you okay with being there? Are you okay with being in mediocrity? Or, or are you one of those that, are, that you want to grow and you want to excel and you're trying to get there? But to be honest with, with everybody in this room tonight and before God, you're barely hanging on. You're barely hanging on by a thread. You see, wherever you are tonight, wherever you are right now, it's not God's desire for you to barely make it across the finish line. That's not what God is looking forward to. That's not what He wants for your life. You see, God wants us to finish strong, but it won't happen without us doing our part to make sure it happens. See, we've already talked about it also tonight. This, this, this whole sermon is just littered with, with nuggets from this morning in Sunday school and the morning, this morning service and even our discipleship time tonight. You see, God is going to do His part. Right? God, we're, we're partnering with Him. We talked about that. That God will do His part. We don't have to concern ourselves with that. And so how we finish in this life is directly related to our attitude towards the Word of God. 
right? That's what this psalmist is pointing out. How we finish is directly related to how we, uh, 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 our attitude and our response to the Word of God. To finish strong is, a, is essential that we learn the Word of God, that we obey the Word of God, that we cling to the Word of God and respect the Word of God. And so stop settling for mediocrity in your walk with Jesus. He expects more. He deserves more. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And so let's be sure to finish strong. Amen? All right, let's pray, and we'll have a time of response. God, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, my heart is full. My mind is full, too, but my heart is so full today. Uh, I've been challenged. I've been encouraged. Lord, I've been convicted of, of many things in my own life. God, help me to be the follower of Jesus I need to be. Help me to be the pastor of this church that I need to be. Lord, help us each one to examine our own hearts tonight and just to be honest before you that we're, we're so good at, at putting on these masks. We're so good at playing the, uh, this game where we all act like everything's okay and we, we'll, we'll say spiritual things and, and we, we, we know how to, to act, we know what to say, but deep down inside, where are we spiritually? Are we dry? Are, are we in a desert? Are we, are we stuck in a deep, deep valley and do we need to... We need help getting out, God. Help us to, to look to you tonight and say, Lord, incline my heart. Help me to love your word. Help me to find delight in your word. Help me to learn your word. Teach me your word. Give me the understanding of your word. And then give me the desire to do what it says, whatever that may be. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for what it means, this community. God, help us to be useful to you. Help us to have a desire to to move out of mediocrity if that's where we're at. Help us to desire excellence in our lives as disciples of Jesus. And Lord, help us to finish strong. To not just barely get by, not to just barely finish, but to finish strong. We can only do that with your help. God, thank you for your spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.